So I mentioned Black Mountain College in North Carolina when I was talking about Robert Rauschenberg. Another avant-garde thinker associated with Black Mountain College was John Cage. Strongly influenced by Marcel Duchamp as well as Eastern philosophy, Cage explored how chance could be used to eliminate intention and personal taste in art making. Primarily a musical composer, Cage's experiments included things like creating altered piano soundscapes by inserting objects between the strings to change the way they sound when they were played. He also did things like playing 12 radios at once, assigning music notes to random marks on a piece of paper, and others. Um, he first arrived at Black Mountain in 1948, where he met and worked alongside Rauschenberg. Um, where Duchamp and Rauschenberg both sought to blur the boundaries between art and life and challenge conventional media, Cage argued that artists might use time to bracket ordinary events and heighten the audience's awareness of the experience, therefore transforming it into art. Collaborating with Rauschenberg, um, he was ultimately sort of inspired to create one of his most famous compositions, which was titled 433. Um, in this performance, a musician sat motionless for four minutes and 33 seconds at the piano without playing while the audience listened. Um, this was in an effort to call attention to the ambient noises that we take um, for silence every day. There's no music, so the ambient noises uh, from the audience kind of become the composition. Whatever sounds happen within that time frame, that four minutes and 33 seconds, uh, people coughing, whispering, um, the noise of traffic outside, all of this becomes the composition. And so hopefully this found soundscape will change the listeners' relationships to these noises when they hear them again outside the performance and kind of make them think differently about it. John Cage organized a piece called Theater Piece Number no. 1 at Black Mountain in 1952. Uh, this took place in a dining hall, and it involved the simultaneous occurrence of various unrelated activities, including a lecture on Zen Buddhism, uh, which was read from atop a ladder, dancers and musicians moving around the audience, a dog running through the performance, and movies projected upside down on the wall. And then Rauschenberg was there and he also was playing these scratchy records during all of this. Cage's ideas about chance and time and his collaborations with Rauschenberg inspired many artists. And so his theater piece number one is sometimes called the first happening. Um, Happenings, it was a term coined by another artist, Alan Capro, to sort of describe these immersive chance-based performances that were meant to overwhelm the audience with a barrage of unrelated activities, um, and they were meant to invoke a variety of sensual and emotional responses. So the term happenings is meant to imply something spontaneous, something that just sort of happens to happen. Um, these tend to combine elements of performance, dance, poetry, and visual art, really blurring the boundaries between art and life and challenging the disciplinary boundaries that divided visual art from dance, music, and theater. Happenings can be highly structured with a planned environment and scripted actions and sounds that are all integral to the work, or they can be more spontaneous and improvisational. The true key to happenings was the active invasion of the viewer's space and the involvement of the audience, knowingly or not, in the artwork's production. As Capro explained, quote, you will become part of the happenings. You will simultaneously experience them. A perfect example of happenings is Carol Schneeman's Meat Joy, enacted first at the Festival de la Livre Expression in Paris, then again in New York where it was filmed and photographed in 1964. The work involved eight men and women who undressed each other, danced and rolled around on the floor wild, wildly, excuse me, um, and playing with this mixture of raw fish, sausages, partially plucked raw and bloody chickens, wet paint, and scraps of paper. The artist wanted both performers and audience members to experience the smell, taste, and feel of the body and its fluids. Some critics called this event an erotic rite and a visceral celebration of flesh and blood. 
it countered the existing idea of artwork as cool and detached in a gallery for the passive viewer to absorb with artists remaining invisible. Instead, it forced the viewer to become complicit in a live event. In the late 1950s, Alan Capro, who had also studied with Cage in New York, he built on assemblage practices to extend artwork into space surrounding the viewer. He argued, quote, artists must become preoccupied and even dazzled by the space and objects of our everyday life. Objects of every sort are materials for the new art. Capra created what he called environments, but today we often use the alternative term installation. Environments or installations are mixed media constructions or assemblages usually designed for a specific place and for a temporary period of time. For example, for his 1961 yard, Capro filled the courtyard of a gallery in Manhattan with used tires, tar paper, and barrels, and then invited viewers to walk through and around the space, thus positioning them within or kind of as part of the artwork itself. Works like Yard call attention to the viewer's physical experience, seeing, moving, touching, smelling, hearing, in this case, stumbling through this dirty urban environment uh, to really emphasize the elements that often get overlooked within everyday life. So Cage's ideas about chance and time, along with the rising emphasis on the artist's creative act, really gave rise to performative impulses throughout the early 1960s and on into the 1970s. In the 1970s, the term performance art was coined to distinguish events such as happenings from more traditional performances like theater and dance. Works of performance art are generally ephemeral events with a strong visual focus orchestrated by visual artists. They may be spontaneous or scripted, performed in front of a live audience or recorded or both. Um, performance art typically does have some form of documentation of its conception and creation. This can be written text, photographs, videos, etc. Although it is the performance itself, not the physical objects that is considered the work of art. Performance, therefore, resists commodification, and it has often been used to critique those who place cultural and economic values on art. Performance art also directly engages with the specifics of space, social reality, and the politics of identity. In the 1960s, a loose international collective of avant-garde artists and composers that called themselves Fluxus they staged events that were more conceptual and deliberate in action than happenings, and they often focused on ordinary events, uh, actions, things like pouring water, cutting your hair, eating food, etc. And then they would perform these actions repeatedly and methodically, sometimes over extended periods of time. The ritualistic nature of Flex's performances underscores the influence of Eastern religious practices, where deep contemplation of routine tasks may result in spiritual enlightenment. One prominent member of Flexus was Japanese artist Yoko Ono, who settled in New York in the early 1960s. Her cut piece, which was first performed in Japan in 1964 and then again in New York City in 1965, Ono knelt passively on stage while members of the audience were invited to use provided sewing scissors uh, to cut away bits of her clothing to take with them. The reliance on the audience to realize the event or artwork and the repetitive ritualistic nature of the action, which here is maybe somewhat suggestive of self-sacrifice and desecration, these are key characteristics of Flux's performances. Ono's performance was charged with implicit violence and eroticism as more and more of her body was revealed over time. It wasn't really seen as such at the time, but Yoko Ono has since explained that the work was, quote, against ageism, racism, sexism, and violence. Korean-American artist Nam Joon Pak is often called the father of video art. He was highly inspired by John Cage's experiments and his background in classical music, along with his interest in mass media and technology, led to early experiments in which he altered broadcasted images with magnets on TV screens. Then in the 1960s, he did a number of collaborations with the musician Charlotte Mormon, and these were included in a couple of Fluxus festivals. 
Um, TV Bra for Living Sculpture combined Pac's interests in technology, sculpture, music, and performance with humor and sexuality. Pac designed a device for Mormon to wear while she was playing the cello. It was wired so that she could manipulate the imagery with foot pedals and with her music. Pack described the combination of sculpture and performance as an effort to humanize technology, but it also highlights the sort of fetishization that happens within our society. Um, people sort of fetishize or, or worship television and mass media, as well as the human body, specifically women's breasts. Mormon becomes a living sculpture, making literal the historical objectification of women and reflecting the fluxus ideas that life itself is art. Also associated with fluxus was the German conceptual and performance artist Joseph Buys, who saw art as a means of social redemption and healing, especially from the horrors and guilt of the Holocaust. He believed that everyone is an artist with the ability and agency to transform the world around them, and he envisioned his performances as social sculptures, actions intended to change society for the better. He often took on a shaman-like persona, and his actions took on the seriousness of sacred rituals with goals of spiritual renewal and transformation, while the materials and objects he incorporates as props often have deeply symbolic meaning and sometimes even personal relevance. His 1965 performance titled How to Explain Pictures to a Dead Hare was staged at an exhibition of his drawings in Germany. Louis first sat in a chair in the window of the locked gallery. He covered his head in honey, symbolizing life, and he put a gold leaf mask over the top of that, symbolizing wealth. He rested his left foot on felt and his right on steel, materials that Bowie's associated with spiritual warmth and cold, hard reason, respectively. In his lap, he held a dead hare, which he muttered to repeatedly and carried around the gallery for several hours, holding it up to his artworks as if to show them to it and then quietly explaining them to it. The act and the use of symbolic materials really implies some sort of spiritual ritual and a deep connection to the animal and to nature in general. Your textbook suggests that the work underscores the inadequacy of words to convey art's true meaning and the potential for profound revelation. Bowie said, quote, even a dead animal preserves more powers of intuition than some human beings. He's also potentially commenting on the ecological impact that humans have on environments. He's said to have described humanity's need for nature and animals as being equivalent to our need for lungs, bones, and organs, and he encouraged us to see those things, nature and animals, as extensions of ourselves. For this 1974 performance titled Coyote, I Like America and America Likes Me, Buies flew from Germany to America, landing at JFK International Airport wearing a fedora and a fishing vest. He exited the plane with his hand held over his eyes, and people ran to greet him, wrapping him in felt from head to toe and placing him in an ambulance that, with lights and sirens going, drove him to the Rene Block Gallery in Manhattan, where he was then, again, wheeled inside. For the next three days, for at least eight hours a day, Louise remained locked in the gallery with nothing but some straw, a felt blanket, a shepherd's crook, 50 copies of the Wall Street Journal, and one live coyote. Throughout the performance, he did not speak or interact with other humans, but he repeatedly attempted to interact with the coyote, performing symbolic gestures like offering its, his gloves to it or dressing up as a sheep. He sometimes tried to wrap the coyote in the felt blanket, which it later took from him and then ripped to shreds. He was finally able to touch the coyote, and then at the end of the performance, he hugged it as a symbol of its tolerance towards him before returning to the airport again via ambulance and then flying back to Germany without ever having truly touched American soil. Bowie stated, quote, I wanted to isolate myself, insulate myself, see nothing of America other than the coyote. The patriotic title here recalls the idea of America as a melting pot, and with the context of 1970s America, a nation that was, you know, divided over their involvement with the Vietnam War, 
that was, it was also simultaneously kind of undergoing a struggle for equal rights and justice. Um, and Bowie's is kind of encouraging Americans here, I think, to coexist in harmony. His ritualistic action was an act of solidarity between indigenous Americans, some of which saw the coyote as a sacred animal able to move between the physical and spiritual worlds, while European settlers saw coyotes as aggressive, intrusive predators and sought to eliminate them. Bowie saw the decimation of the coyote population by European settlers as symbolic of the violence of white men on indigenous cultures and sought to activate spiritual healing. He envisioned the coyote as a spirit animal of Native America, one that has adapted and thrived as a symbol of resilience. He said, quote, you could say that a reckoning has to be made with the coyote, and only then can this trauma be lifted. He also argued that American society could only begin to cure its social ills through the direct communication with and understanding of its own varied populations. So the experiments of the early 1960s marked a crucial turning point for new artistic formats. Art critics John R. Chandler and Lucy Labarde characterized the period by the dematerialization of art that resulted from a shift away from traditional painting and sculpture. Ephemeral, anti-aesthetic, and unskilled art forms were quite popular, emphasizing artistic concept over the visual appearance of the final art object. At the heart of this movement was Duchamp's earlier assertion that the idea motivating the artist to create could be separated from the artwork's final form, whose primary function was to communicate meaning to the viewer. The term conceptual art refers to works that emphasize the idea or concept of a work and downplay the crafting process and the visual appearance of the final form. Indebted to Duchamp, conceptual art appeals to the mind rather than the senses. Conceptual artist Sol LeWitt wrote in 1967, the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the art and what work, or excuse me, what the work of art looks like isn't too important. Conceptual artists of the 1960s and 70s and onward explored a variety of media. Some made objects, while others explored performance, temporary or ephemeral works, video, and language. Really whatever they felt best represented their concept and called attention to how they had developed an idea to its final outcome. For this reason, conceptual artworks often have some form of documentation of their conception and creation. This can be written text, photos, film, etc. Additionally, conceptual art tends to resist commodification, and it often carries an implicit or sometimes explicit critique of those who place cultural and economic values onto art. Conceptual artists like Joseph Kosuth rejected traditional aesthetics and employed language itself as a medium for art. Kosuth explored the role of visual signs to communicate meaning, as in this work, One and Three Chairs. Here he's illustrated three distinct visual forms and linguistic symbols that represent the single abstract idea of chair. On the left, a photographic representation of a chair. In the center, an actual wooden chair. And then on the right, a printed dictionary definition of the word chair. This can be read in a couple different ways. We could read it as one chair presented three different ways, or we could read it as three different chairs. Which of these three iterations is more real? Which provides the most information or best represents the concept of chair? Kosuth highlights the inherent ambiguity in language and systems of communication and challenges viewers to consider how we learn and express ideas and to reevaluate the systems that endow art with value and meaning. Similarly, Bruce Nauman considered the role of language and visual representation in demonstrating our identities. He used performance, video, and other non-traditional media to explore the effects of physical, psychological, and in intellectual experiences. Between 1966 and 67, Nauman made a series of 11 photos based on reenactments of common words and phrases. For example, this self-portrait as Fountain shows the artist bare-chested, tipping his head back and spitting water into the air. He's thinking about both the visual appearance and the concept of a fountain, particularly classically styled ones that often feature nude figurative statues. The photograph pulls together artistic and personal identity, bodily experience, and visual communications. 
It documents the artist's physical transformation into a fountain, and it acts as a self-portrait that presents the artist as his own work of art. The title and choice of a fountain as a subject recalls Duchamp's notorious 1917 fountain as well, suggesting that Nauman is recreating the famous ready-made using his own body, which in some ways might be considered the ultimate ready-made. Nauman's work uses humor and wit to really engage the viewer and to thoroughly investigate challenging conceptual issues. Because of the inherent immateriality and ephemerality of performance art, it is directly linked to conceptual art. So I've included just a couple more examples here. Um, here we have Chris Burden. Um, and he sort of demonstrates how the human body plays an important role in performance art as the medium with which the artist creates. The actions that they or that the audience performs are central to the work of art. For many artists, using their bodies and performances became a way to question social conventions, transcend the everyday, claim control over their bodies and lives, or maybe to question issues of gender and identity. So in 1971, Chris Burden was 25 years old, um, and he staged a performance titled Shoot in a California gallery. Um, he stood in the gallery in front of a small audience, and he had a friend shoot him in the arm at close range. Now, this is quite dangerous. Only a few inches off, and the bullet could have hit his heart, and he, of course, would have died. Um, now, the eight-second-long footage of the performance shows that the artist himself was apparently quite shaken by the shot, and he promptly walks off the screen. Uh, the bullet was only supposed to raise his arm, but the person shooting it was a little bit off target, and so it went directly through his arm. Seconds after the shot, the attendees and the artist had to deal with the wound, and they went to the hospital and then had to explain what had happened, kind of leaving the hospital staff in shock. But, like a lot of body and performance art, Burden was seeking to break the limitations of the body, and therefore the mind, by engaging in extreme actions that put the body into a state of pain, ecstasy, or transgression. But, the implicit brutality and violence of the action reminds us of the fragility of human life, and then that connects us to the social and political context of the time. Again, America in the 1970s was divided over the involvement in the Vietnam War, where thousands of young men were being exposed to similar conditions as burden, but much worse. I think he's also thinking about the willingness of young people in America at the time to sort of stand up and protest, often taking radical actions and putting themselves at risk in an effort to make the world a better place. In the same way that Duchamp took a urinal out of its original context and forced us to see it differently, Chris Burden has taken guns in the act of shooting out of context. Do we see it differently? Shoot, along with many of Burden's other works, was aimed to question the moral stance that humans have constructed towards pain and the profound nature of violence that is never fully suspended regardless of the legal system. He was interested in pushing the spectators to understand an actual reality of torment, agony, and desperation. Somewhat similarly, Serbian performance artist Marina Abramovic began using her body as both subject and medium for performances that test her physical, mental, and emotional limits in a quest for heightened consciousness, transcendence, and self-transformation. Since the 1970s, her performances have been characterized by endurance, pain, and repetitive behaviors. This particular blend of epic struggle and self-inflicted violence was born out of the contradictions of her childhood. Both of her parents had been high-ranking officials in the socialist Serbian government, and her grandmother, with whom she had lived, was devoutly Serbian Orthodox. Though personal in origin, the explosive force of Abramovich's art and performances spoke to a generation of Yugoslavian people who were undergoing the tightening control of communist rule. Truly ephemeral, Abramovich's earliest performances, including her rhythm series of 1973 and 4, were documented only by crude black and white photographs and descriptive texts. For her 1974 performance, Rhythm 5, she constructed a star shape of wood shavings, which she then covered in gasoline and lit on fire. 
She spent some time circling the fire, trimming her hair and fingernails and dropping the clippings into it before she then lay down inside the burning star. She lay there until she lost consciousness from a lack of oxygen and her clothing caught fire and ultimately she had to be rescued by audience members. It was after that that she said she became interested in how physical pain and exhaustion can help make a person completely present and aware of themselves. <clears throat> she said, quote, I realized the subject of my work should be the limits of my body. I would use performance to push my mental and physical limits beyond consciousness. Um, here's another work. This is Rhythm Zero, a six-hour performance in Naples um, in 1974. Here, Abramovich stood still and invited audience members to do whatever they wanted to her using one of 72 objects that she'd provided, including things like a rose, feathers, perfume, honey, bread, but also things like a scalpel, nails, and a gun loaded with one bullet. She wanted the viewers to become active participants, to really see how far the public would go. By the third hour of the performance, a lot of her clothing had been cut off. By the fourth hour, some audience members had started to cut her skin, while others tried to protect her or to wipe away her tears. Then someone made her take the loaded gun, worked her finger around the trigger, and made her hold it to her own head. A fight broke out within the audience, and the gallery ultimately stepped in and ended the performance. Later, Abramovich recounted that as soon as she began to move about the space again, acting like a human rather than an object, most of the audience was unable to face her and they bolted from the room. In 1980, together with German artist Ulai, her then partner and collaborator, she released a four minute long performance called Rest Energy, where Ulai held a tightened bow with an arrow pointed directly at her heart while she held on to the other side. Small microphones attached to their chests picked up the sounds of their heartbeats becoming more and more intense as time goes on. And so this work really sort of emphasizes the exploration of the very fragile line between life and death. Abramovich and Ulai met in 1976, after which they lived a nomadic lifestyle together, traveling and performing across Europe. Their numerous and varied works were often tests of mental, physical, and emotional lengths. For relation and time, they spent 17 hours tied together by their hair. In other works, they explored extremes, including running into each other full steam, slapping each other, imposing their naked bodies into public spaces, etc. Between 1983 and 88, they proposed to become the first people to walk the length of the Great Wall of China in a work entitled The Great Wall Walk or The Lovers. Each artist would start at opposite ends of the Great Wall, and after walking about 1,242 miles each, they would meet in the middle where they intended to get married. But by the time they had worked out all the logistics and walked all the miles, the pair found that they had grown apart, and after this, they did not see or speak to each other again for 22 years. <laughs> 